brother-in-law and sister-in-law moved to Ocala, Florida. And it wasn't long until they began telling me about a young man that they had met there and was a member of the church there. About that same period of time, that young man went to Bowling Green, Kentucky, where he attended Western Kentucky University. And both of my children were in school up there at the time, and their paths not only crossed, but merged uh, with a very kind and warm feeling that has continued through the years. That was my first real contact with Brother Thaxter Dickey. He's a native of Georgia, but grew up in Ocala. After attending Florida State, he then went to Western Kentucky, where he got his bachelor degree with a major in psychology and a minor in speech. While he was at Western Kentucky, he got involved in the forensics program, and to say he excelled is an understatement. He then returned and entered the University of South Florida and began teaching with us, teaching psychology and working some with our forensics program. He's received his master's degree from the University of South Florida and is presently writing his dissertation which will complete a PhD in psychology from the same institution. Baxter began preaching in and around Atlanta. He became a close friend with the Broadwells there. Since that time, he's preached for the Peters Creek Church in Kentucky and then with a number of congregations here in Florida while he has been engaged both as a student at USF and teaching with us here at Florida College. I happen to have personal knowledge of his work with several of these congregations and in every case it has been so well received and so highly respected by the brethren there he worked for a while with the northeast congregation in gainesville he preached for about a year with the largo congregation and he is now preaching for the northeast congregation in clearwater a very personable young man, tremendously capable, has endeared himself to the students here and made one of the wisest choices of anybody I know when while he was a student at Western Kentucky, he met one of our former students, Wanda Down, and had the good judgment to ask her to be his wife. And Thaxter and Wanda are dearly loved, got a little boy, they're dearly loved, highly respected, and it's a pleasure to have him on our lecture program, and it's a personal pleasure for me to present him to you at this time to speak on the topic, Triumph in Christ. Thanks for Dick. Thank you, Bob, and uh, I want to thank uh, Brother Melvin Curry and Brother Alvin Williams of the Bible Department here for asking me to participate in this uh, lecture series. It is a privilege and an honor, and in some ways an embarrassment to me. I know that there are dozens, more than dozens of men who could do as good or better a job than I would do this morning, and I feel a little bit like Jeremiah when he was called upon to preach, and he said, uh, I don't know what to speak. I am but a youth. I know there are some who will begrudge me counting myself as a youth, and it won't be many years I won't be able to say that, but I feel the weight of the wisdom of years as I stand here in this place where so many great men have stood and so many great thoughts have been expressed. I recognize what many of you probably have already suspected, that my choice to speak here this day has been... Uh, a matter of just being in a particular place at a particular time and it's not due to any particular talents of my own. I recognize that and I'm humbled by the opportunity that I have. I'm not a great theologian, 
I'm not a great Bible scholar nor a great preacher, but I do share with all of you here, I think, uh, the fact that I am a Christian and a servant of God. And it's from that common base that I hope that I can address you this morning and say some things that will be profitable to you as we think this morning about the triumph of Christ. It seems to me that in my work in the Lord's kingdom that the greatest problem that I face is a problem shared by so many people, and that's the problem of discouragement. I am confident that it's that problem of discouragement to which the Hebrew writer refers in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, the first verse, when he says, seeing that we are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which does so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us. It is discouragement that so often besets us, and it is a sin when we let that discouragement cause us to draw back into destruction, as that Hebrew writer had said in the last verse of the 10th chapter. We face discouragement, and it seems a little bit inappropriate, I suspect, to talk about discouragement on this day and in this setting when we're, we're so enthusiastic and so filled with uh, joy at the presence of so many other fellow workers in the kingdom. But I think it's precisely because this is an unusual setting that we so appreciate it and are so enthusiastic about the opportunity to be here. Many of you, I suspect, are going to leave this place and go back to congregations where the apathy of the brethren will rise up as if to choke you or go into places where you're preaching the gospel and the indifference of the people or the outright hostility of those to whom you preach will become a burden to you that threatens your very existence as a Christian or even those of us who are fortunate to work among uh, good and enthusiastic groups of Christians and strong congregations. There are problems there that you thought once you had resolved and you find that they've just been in hiding to an appropriate moment to rear their ugly heads again. Discouragement is a problem that we face, and it's a problem with which we must deal if we're going to be successful servants of God. Paul's relationship with the Corinthian church was just such a source of discouragement, perhaps even more so than any that you and I have faced. And the writing of the second Corinthian letter is an occasion that's a specific example of this opportunity for discouragement. Paul had sent his fellow worker Titus to Corinth to straighten out some matters there. Evidently because he felt that it would have been too hard for him to go there and try and straighten those matters out since he'd already been there and written to them about those matters. He was so anxious to hear how Titus had fared in Corinth that he couldn't remain in Ephesus nor even remain in Troas as he journeyed on his way even though there were great opportunities for preaching there. Instead he went on into Macedonia to meet Titus. Titus' report to him was primarily positive. Many good things had happened to him there. He'd been received warmly by the brethren. Many of them had been brought to repentance by the things that he'd said to them and the message that he brought to, from Paul. But there were some negative things in that message too. There were those at Corinth who were criticizing Paul. And the very Corinthians who should have been stout in his defense were listening to those criticisms. And Paul responds to that kind of uh, report in a way that might seem puzzling to us. He says, I'm perplexed but not despairing, 2 Corinthians 4 and 8. And then he writes in the passage we have for our consideration this morning in 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, verses 14 through 17. But thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are the fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing to the one and aroma from death to death, to the other in aroma, from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? For we're not like many peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. Now it seems to me as I read these words, this is a puzzling reaction to the message that Paul has just received. As he defends himself throughout the second Corinthian letter, it seems to me the charges that are being leveled against him in Corinth are very serious charges. There are some who are accusing him of vacillating, that he can't make up his mind, that he judges after the flesh, some accusing him of being a coward, that he writes strong letters, but when he's with us, he's not so strong in speech. There are those who question his credentials, some who, who even question whether he's an apostle or not. As you read through the second Corinthian letter, you can see as he defends himself against these various charges, what they must have been. There are some who suggest that he was deceitful among them, that he in fact had demeaned the Corinthians and himself by working with his hands while he was there. And some suggestion even, as he writes so carefully about how he's going to take care of that contribution he's collecting for the saints in Judea, 
some suggestion that he might intend to embezzle those funds. Those are serious charges indeed. But Paul is not concerned about defending himself, not right away. He even admits his inadequacy in the face of these charges. He's not so much concerned about his, uh, his, his personal approval because that's not why he's preaching the gospel. He preaches the gospel for their sake. And so before he begins to defend himself throughout the rest of the gospel, he wants to remind these Corinthians of who they are and of what God has done for them through, incidentally, his servant, G, uh, uh, Paul, there in Corinth. And so in order to put them in the proper framework to appreciate the things that they have in, in God and in Christ Jesus, he uses a most impressive image to describe for them the victory of Jesus Christ. And that image that he chooses to use is that of the Roman general's triumph through the city of Rome. Those Roman generals who had won especially notable victories were singled out for special honor. They were brought into the city of Rome and a day was set and all the streets would be lined with people and the rooftops would be filled as the people waited for the parade to come by. And the Senate and the city officials themselves would march first in his honor. And then the people would strain their eyes to see the chariot of honor holding the general that they were there to give honor to. And it was led always by milk-white horses. And the women would throw flowers and weep with emotion when it came by, and the men would clench their jaws and shout and chain to that chariot. There would be the slaves that he had taken in this latest victory, former kings and queens who had been enemies of the state of Rome, now defeated and crushed and led with chains around their necks through the streets of Rome. And behind them would come the priests with their sweet-smelling incense and savor. And those who didn't even come out of their houses would smell that incense and know that the triumph of Rome was spreading abroad. But though it would smell of triumph to those who were Roman, it would rankle the defeat in the nostrils of those who were slaves and enchained now to the chariot. Behind them would come musicians with songs of honor and his praise, and then the cart after cart pile with the booty of war, and then the soldiers, last of all, marching. It was an impressive thing, maybe a once-in-a-lifetime thing for some, and it would have been an impressive image just in and of its own right. But Paul doesn't just appeal to that as an image about a Roman general's triumph. Rather, he uses that to picture for them and for us the triumph of the Lord Jesus Christ. For the Lord Jesus Christ is victorious, and it is the Lord of glory, the all-victorious Christ Jesus that Paul serves. And note this, too, about Paul. He's not seeing that vision of victory as if it were something to happen in the future. No, Paul's a hard-nosed pragmatist, and he sees what is now a present occurrence, and he draws encouragement from that fact. No wonder he's not concerned about defending himself. There's no need for him to defend himself, because there is no power that can snatch him from the hand of the God who loves him and is leading him in the triumph of Jesus Christ. Personal approval is not the problem. It's not the central issue for Paul because he is a part of the victory of Jesus Christ. Discouragement is not a problem for him because he is a part of the victory of Jesus Christ. There are those who have misunderstood the triumph of Christ. There are some Christians who think that there is now a great conflict engaged between good and evil and the outcome of which is in some way in doubt and that there's to be a pivotal premillennial battle to be fought at some time in the future and that that battle will determine the outcome of this conflict between good and evil. Such a view fails to apprehend correctly the nature of the God that we serve. The God that we serve says in Psalms 24 and 1 that the earth is his and the fullness thereof. There is no doubt about the outcome of any conflict in which he will engage. He has won the victory already through Jesus Christ. But those dispensationalists who look for some future battle have failed to understand correctly the work of Jesus. He did not fail when he came here the first time to establish a glorious kingdom and then return to the Father to wait some more auspicious occasion. They failed to correctly understand the nature of the church. It's not a pale substitute for the glorious kingdom Jesus failed to establish. That's not the scriptural view at all. The scriptures in Acts 20 and 28 talk about the church as the blood-bought institution. In Ephesians, Paul talks about the church as the instrument through which God intends to display to principalities and powers his manifold wisdom. These things are not second rate. These are the things that Jesus intended. They see Jesus as weak and crucified because of weakness. But that's not the picture that the Bible paints of Jesus. Jesus is victorious. 
the early church understood the victory of Jesus and the fact that he reigns over the earth, they were quick to understand that the 110th Psalm was to be applied to Jesus Christ and his work here in this earth. In Acts, the second chapter, Peter preaches about Jesus and applies that very passage to him. In Acts, the second chapter, in the 32nd uh, verse, this Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses, Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Jesus reigns now over the earth. The first century Christians understood that. But in their own minds, there came a conflict, a threat, a challenge to this reign as they experienced the persecutions and the sufferings of the latter part of the first century. And many of them, I suspect, resorted to the kind of reasoning that we hear today about the reign of Christ, that he reigns in heaven and someday will reign on earth, or that he reigns in the hearts of Christian men and women. No, indeed, Jesus Christ does not reign in just those metaphorical ways. He reigns over the earth, over the world of cruel, cold facts, or else he doesn't reign at all. And to answer these early first century suspicions about the reign of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit sent a message to John, which he reveals to us in Revelation. And the message of that book is what he says in Revelation 1 and 5, that Jesus is Lord of lords and King of kings. He rules over earthly kings. The whole message of the book is that Jesus Christ reigns and rules. And it's surprising to me that the millennialists of all denominations will resort to this book to demonstrate that Jesus is someday in the future going to establish his kingdom, when in fact the one message of the book is that he reigns now. In Revelation, the fifth chapter, for instance, John weeps because he sees the scroll of God's plan for the earth, and there's no one worthy to open it. But the elders say to him, don't weep. The Lion of Judah, because of the victories he's overcome, is worthy to open that. And so John turns to see the Lion of Judah, but he doesn't see the lion, instead he sees the lamb, the sacrificial lamb with the marks of the knife still at his throat. And indeed, Jesus Christ had overcome and was worthy to open the scroll of God's purpose for the earth, but he had not overcome with Peter's sword. He had not overcome with the legions of angels that he could have called. He had instead overcome with his love and willingness to submit himself, to sacrifice himself on the cross. But the victory that he won there on the cross was made possible only because of the previous victories that he'd won in his life. On the evening before, he was to be arrested and tried and then crucified in John the 16th chapter and the 33rd verse. Jesus, talking to his disciples, says, I have overcome the world. And indeed, he had overcome the world. We forget sometimes in the glorious picture of Jesus as miracle worker and master teacher that he dealt with life on the same terms that you and I must deal with it, that he came into this world and he lived as a man must live, and that in living as a man must live, he had done something that no other man had ever done. He lived without sin. He had overcome the world. We know very little about those early years of Jesus' life. From the time that he speaks in the temple, did you not know I'd be about my father's business, until the time he's baptized by John in the River Jordan, we know nothing or very little. We have the testimony of men concerning those years. In Mark, the sixth chapter, Jesus goes back to preach in the town of his boyhood in Nazareth. And as he preaches, they marvel at what this man is saying. But some of them will say, is this not Jesus, the carpenter? Don't we know his brothers and his sisters? Are they not still with us? By that, they are suggesting that when he was growing up there, they had not noted anything particularly different about him. Now, that's not to say that he wasn't different, but it is to say that in terms of development and occupation and responsibilities and, indeed, temptations, this Jesus had lived as any man of his time would have. But our understanding of his life in those years would be incomplete without hearing what God has to say about it. On the time of his baptism, God speaks from heaven and says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Ordinarily, we focus on the fact that he is made the startling statement, this is my son. But the equally startling statement is that he has been well-pleasing. In all of those years, he had lived as a man should have lived. He had lived without sin, tempted in all points as we are, and yet without sin. He had overcome the world. And that victory in his life of overcoming the world made possible the subsequent victory that he would win for us in his death. 
And Jesus recognizes that, that that battle is coming. As he talks with those disciples of his on the last uh, evening together with them, he says in John 14 and verse 30, the ruler of the world is coming. Jesus recognized that another battle was about to be engaged, a great and momentous battle. But his opportunity to come into that battle was won with his previous victory in life. And now we'll see if he can be victorious in death. And indeed, it is a story of death. And a story of death may seem to us not so much a story of victory as of defeat. But you know the story well. We love the story as we see this man, Jesus, surrounded by all the manifold evil of mankind, the traitorous, covetous Judas, and the base and lying witnesses, and the vile and blasphemous priests who combine to bring charges against him. And then there's the arrogant Pilate who fails to execute properly his responsibilities for justice, and the cruel and insensate soldiers who take pleasure in inflicting suffering and humiliation on this man, and the cowardly disciples who run and leave him alone, and the cruel and rapacious crowd that just days before were shouting hosannas, hosannas to this man, now shout crucify him, crucify him. And why? Because he didn't become king like they wanted him to be. Crucify him, they shout. And then there again, as he hangs on the cross, you see those, those, those wicked priests come out and they wag their head at him and mock him. You'd have thought, evil as they were, they'd have had more dignity and more respect for their office, that once having accomplished their purpose, they would have gone off quietly and let it happen. But no, they have to come and savor the moment. And behind all of these wicked and evil forces, there is the malignant Satan who is directing all of this in order to crush this man, Jesus, who has dared to rise up against him. And indeed, it would seem to us that, that all is lost. As Jesus hangs there on the cross, he shouts so pitifully, I thirst. And yet even there, we see the power of the cross, don't we? As some of that ungodly mob are moved by mercy to offer him drink. And we see other changed lives here, too, at the base of the cross. There is hanging next to him a thief who is brought to repentance by his goodness. There is that, uh, that cruel centurion who has commanded Roman officers and Roman soldiers in conflict who after it's all over says, surely this was the Son of God. It is a story of victory. And Jesus lets us know that when at the end he shouts, it is finished. And indeed it was finished. For he had come to his death faithful and without answering the temptations of the priest as they mocked him and said, come down off of that cross if you're the Son of God. No, he had not come down off of that cross. He had refused to bow to the temptation to return evil for evil. Instead, he would whisper, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And do you understand the significance of that? He who through all of his life had said with all of the authority of divinity, your sins are forgiven. Go forth and sin no more. Now, much like all other men, pray, Father, forgive them. For he has taken on the burden of sin, divested himself of divinity in that last moment so that he might be really our propitiation. But he remained faithful through death, and he won there a victory. And that leaves him still with a victory to win, the victory over death. And that really is just the fruit of his previous victories. And it is such sweet fruit because he wins it not only for himself, but he wins it for you and for me as well, that no longer may death have any control over us. No longer are we held in, in slavery to it through the fear of death. For we know, as the Apostle Peter says, and see how contemptuous he is of the enemy when he says, it was impossible that death should hold him. Impossible that death should hold him. Contemptuous of the enemy, as you and I ought to be contemptuous of the enemy because we have believed his promise that we too shall be raised from the dead like he is. And what sweet promises await us after that? Perhaps the sweetest of all in 1 John 3 and 2 where the Apostle John says that he shall come and we shall be with him and we shall be like him. What a great thrill to know that someday we'll never again have to worry about feeling regret for wrongdoing because we'll be pure just as Jesus is pure. He triumphed over death. And Paul again in Colossians 2 and 15 describes for us this triumph in his resurrection with the image of the Roman general's triumph. In Colossians, the second chapter, in the 15th verse, he writes, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through it. And the it he refers to here is back in the 14th verse, the cross, the very engine of his destruction becomes the chariot of his honor. It becomes the chariot to which his captives are chained. 
It becomes the instrument through which he humiliates those who would have defeated him. For Jesus, just as the Roman general, carries captives with him along through his triumph. Ephesians 4 and 8 says that when he ascended on high, he led captive, captive. And what are the captives that Jesus leads chained to his cross, his chariot of honor? There are all the enemies of mankind. There is Satan chained, no longer able to hurt us. He is enslaved to Jesus Christ. No longer does demon possession haunt the land. No longer can he touch us in such a way that he can strip us from the hand of God. Romans the 8th chapter, verses 37 through 39. The only thing that can strip us from the hand of God is we ourselves, if we choose to let ourselves slip. Satan has no power over us. He can't even tempt us beyond what we're able to bear. And there, too, the sin, chain, no longer with any power over us. The condemnation of sin Jesus has taken away by suffering in our place and satisfying the law. And the power of sin, and what is the power of sin? The power of sin, Romans 6 and 19, is that we get enslaved to it, that one sin leads to another sin, leads to another sin. Oh, you'll get discouraged because you failed and now you don't have the heart to try again. That's the power of sin, but he's broken that power because we have an advocate with the Father. We can pray through Jesus and he will forgive us. And we can start anew every hour of our lives if necessary and sin no longer has any power over us. And sin has no power to tempt us either because we've seen in the life of Jesus Christ what perfect beauty and righteousness is and so now with spiritual eyes we see through the superficial delight of sin and see the real ugliness underneath. He's broken the power of sin. And chained there as a captive too is the last enemy, death. No longer do we fear death because we've seen Jesus has the power over it. And so, we fear it not, no longer enslaved by it. And finally, enslaved as captives to the cross of Jesus Christ, there are you and I and all other Christians. That's our place, isn't it, in the triumph of Christ. As captives, properly so. Romans, the sixth chapter, Paul says that we once were enslaved to sin, now we're enslaved to righteousness. And the only way that you get to share in the triumph of Jesus Christ is by taking up your cross and following him. You have to come through the cross to get into that triumph. That's what the whole picture of Romans, the sixth chapter, is about. Particularly in the early part of that chapter where he says that it's through baptism, which is the likeness of his death and his burial and his resurrection, that we become chained to Jesus Christ, enslaved to him, that we are crucifying the old man and putting on the new man, taking out the old human nature and putting in the nature of Christ. The only way you get to share in the victory of Jesus Christ is by going through the cross. There is a sense, however, in which we are led in the triumph not as slaves, but as something much more marvelous than that, as heirs and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Those Roman generals who were enjoying the triumph of their day would, on occasion, let a relative or a beloved friend ride along with them and share in the honor and the glory. And Jesus Christ reaches down and he says to you and to me, step up here in the chariot with me and share in the honor. And what greater honor is there than to share with Jesus Christ as the glory that was his before the beginning of the world is restored to him, to ride with him in that pageant that stretches across the face of the universe, not just for a day, but for all eternity. We can share in the triumph, but only if we're willing to take up our crosses and follow him. That's why Paul must finally defend himself, because he recognizes that as an apostle of Jesus Christ, that he cares about in his body the death of Jesus, 2 Corinthians 4 and 10. And so he can't allow the Corinthians to accuse him and to get away with that. He can't allow them to think he is defeated, else they think his Lord is defeated too. But he doesn't defend himself. He's not discouraged because they have disapproved of him, because he sees continually that triumph of Jesus Christ and he feels that he's led along in that triumph by God through Jesus Christ and he wants the Corinthians to follow him he said to them be imitators of me as I'm an imitator of Christ and he would say to you and to me if he were here today won't you join in that triumph with us and how do we attach ourselves to that triumph it is not as some suspect by joining with God's forces in the valley of Megiddo, in that premillennial battle, and turning the tide of battle in the favor of God. Oh, no. Have we gone, grown so arrogant about our, our strength and our abilities and our usefulness to God that we must be reminded, as he reminded the Israelites of old in Psalms 50, that if I were hungry, I would not tell you. The earth is mine, the fullness thereof, the cattle on a thousand hills. 
No, and if God did need to depend upon us, then he would be in trouble indeed, for we've proven ourselves weak in the past, and we would not be very useful to him. No, the victory is already won in Jesus Christ. He's already done the work. He was victorious in his life. He was victorious to death. He was victorious over death through his resurrection, and he invites us to share in that triumph. And how do we share in that triumph? We share in that triumph, not by joining in some premillennial battle, but by being faithful here and now in this life. Faith is the key to victory, John says in 1 John 5 and 4. It is faith that is the victory that overcomes the world. And the faith that he talks about is not just some mental sin of saying, oh, yes, I know there is a Jesus, and I remember those things. The faith that he talks about is the faith the Bible talks about, the kind of faith that will change a man radically, and it changes a man by giving him information that he never had before. Faith, as the Bible talks about it, is the evidence of things not seen and the substance of things hoped for. It is a new kind of vision, an ability to see new information that the unbelievers don't have, and thus having that new information to act in such a way that would be startling to those people of the world. That's exactly the kind of faith that we see in Hebrews the 11th chapter, where the writer there gives examples of faith. Hebrews 11 and 27, he says of Moses, By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king. And isn't that a strange thing that Moses did? His contemporaries would have looked at him with a great deal of disdain and amusement. How could a man give up such a position in the kingdom of Egypt, the most powerful in the world at the time, give up all the wisdom and all the luxury and all the power that was his in that kingdom, and join himself to being a slave with a slave people? What a foolish decision. But the verse goes on, Hebrews 11 and 27, saying, He endured seeing him who was unseen. He had some information they didn't have by faith. He could see the coming of the glory of the kingdom of God, and he wanted to be a part of that, and he saw that worthy of whatever he had to give up in Egypt. The same thing is true about Paul. He had that kind of faith. In 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, he writes about the kinds of things that he has suffered, and he says that those things have not caused him discouragement. 2 Corinthians 4 and 16, Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction, momentary light affliction, you're going to study, I am certain, sometime this week, the 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians, where Paul talks about momentary light afflictions. He talks about the things that he suffered. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. On and on and on and on. Momentary light afflictions, he says. Momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look... Not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. By faith, he sees the eternal weight of glory that far outweighs all of these things that he's suffering, and he can say they're momentary light afflictions. Do you and I have that kind of faith? Or do we grow discouraged at the momentary foibles of the brethren and the insults of the world? Paul never grew discouraged to the point that he wanted to draw back into destruction. He might have been perplexed, but he wasn't despairing. He had faith to see the triumph of Jesus Christ, to see right now the pageant of Jesus' triumph across the face of the universe. He sees it, and he draws comfort from it. That's the kind of faith that we need. And that faith has, first of all, got to be humble, because you don't get into the kingdom of heaven on your own merits. You have to recognize that. You have to have the kind of faith that that Syrophoenician woman had when Jesus so gently, where others would have been harsh, so gently suggested that as a Gentile she was nothing but a dog. And she says, truth, Lord, but even the dogs get to eat some of the crumbs. You've got to have that kind of humble faith, which when the Lord says to you, sinner, you say, truth, Lord, but let me participate in your grace. We grow discouraged so many times because we're proud, and we look to ourselves for the solution to our problems, and you and I are not big enough to solve our own problems. We're not big enough to solve the problems of the church. We're not big enough to solve the problems of the world. Jesus Christ is the only one who can solve them. And the first thing you need if you're going to be successful as a servant of God, as a Christian, is humility. And that comes from seeing Jesus Christ for what he is. And trusting him to do what he said he's going to do. Paul wrote in Philippians 4 and 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do you trust God to provide the increase when you've done the best that you can? That's the source of discouragement, pride and a failure to trust God. And this kind of faith is a faith that hopes great things. 
was impressed by C.S. Lewis, who said that sometimes we think it's our desires that get us in trouble because they lead us off after things that, that, that are sinful. But it really, our, our, our hopes and our desires get us in trouble because they're so weak. We, we, we want pleasure for a moment. We want a little bit of material goods here. When God is offering us the glory of Jesus Christ in all eternity, and, and, and we, we hope for these pitiful small things and desire them when we can have the big things, the faith that the Bible talks about is a faith that is bold in what it hopes for. Do you hope to share with Jesus Christ the reign over the whole universe throughout eternity? That's a bold and a magnificent hope. That's the kind of hope that keeps one strong even in the midst of things that could cause discouragement. And the kind of faith that the Bible talks about is the kind of faith which is confident. Paul had every reason for being discouraged in the work at Corinth, had every reason for even avoiding that work in the first place. Corinthians were so despised by their own drunken contemporaries that if you wanted to make a little ethnic joke in those days, you talked about Corinthians, and everybody kind of tittered because they recognized the Corinthian tripping across the stage of the play as the drunken, immoral fool. But Paul went there, and he was successful in his work there. He had confidence in the gospel of Jesus Christ. This faith by which we have a part in the victory is an active faith. Paul always writes about the great principles in every book, Romans, Ephesians, Philippians, Corinthians. He writes about the great principles of the gospel, but then he gets right down to the case, and he doesn't, he doesn't just leave those principles fallow. He brings the lesson home in a great deal of practicality. There's always the great therefores in Paul's lessons, in Paul's letters, the great therefores. In this second Corinthian letter, for instance, there are no fewer than six therefores in the five chapters following Paul's vision of the triumph of Christ. Second Corinthians 4, 1, therefore we do not lose heart. Second Corinthians 4, 16, therefore we do not lose heart. Second Corinthians 5, 9, therefore also we have as our ambition to be pleasing to him. Therefore, 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 this faith demands something of us. No, it doesn't demand something of us. It demands everything we've got. This faith that attaches us to Jesus Christ has to be active because it's attaching us to the most victorious and active figure the world has ever seen. Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the all-conquering Jesus. Jesus has been utterly victorious over Satan and sin and death, and he invites us up into the chariot of honor with him as he makes a public display of those enemies across the face of the universe. What then is there for us to fear when he promises us the victory too? There's a period of time now until the second coming while you and I have to do battle individually with those foes, but not on our own because he strengthens us. And we don't have to fight them in their full power because he's already defeated them and they're dispirited and it's a rear guard action that they fight and that's all. Jesus has won the victory. And God says you can get on the winning side right now. You know, most times when you have to choose sides or pick a team, there's always some risk of picking the wrong one and being on the losing side. Not so with God. 2 Peter 3 and 9. For God is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to uswards, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so God, in a moment of time, waits before he pulls up the threads of his victory and separates the sheep from the goats, and he says and he begs and he pleads through Jesus Christ and the servants of Jesus Christ, won't you please get on the winning side while there is yet time? The victory is won in Jesus Christ. And there is no cause or opportunity for discouragement or despair among those who are servants of God. Paul says of his especially arduous suffering as an apostle, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. He goes on to say that he suffers these things for our sakes, and that while death works in him, life works in us, and thus we have even more reason for confidence than he had. Because we have the historic witness of the apostles and previous lives of saints who have been victorious. The power is supplied. The victory is assured. God has won it through Jesus Christ and he waits only to share it with us. Will you not let God lead you as he led Paul in the triumph of Jesus Christ? Climb by faith into the chariot of honor and share in his glory as a co-heir. And if we are already co-heirs, and share in that great victory as Christians, then can we not give up our cowardly trembling and our discouragement and our cynicism 
and live as victors ought to with confidence and joy. May God bless you as you're led in the victory of Jesus Christ. Thank you.